Hello and welcome back to our survey of church history, the church's story. Our most recent lesson was on the Protestant Reformation, or scholars sometimes say Reformations. And we want to remind ourselves, since it's been a couple of weeks now, we've been, we were off last week, that the Protestant Reformation was a protest movement of various people and kind of the world was kind of ready for it. And so it arose in, in various quarters kind of all at once in some ways um, from so various people from within the Catholic Church. And it started out as a reform from within, but things escalated quickly and it became a break with the Roman Catholic Church that created various Protestant groups. Now, the Reformation itself was from 1517 to 1555. We mark the beginning when Luther was, uh, you know, announcing his debates about these various points that he had of issue with the Roman Catholic Church at the time. But later, um, Luther, Luther's points became um, breaking points. And so the Lutherans broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, the, um, and then other groups in Switzerland, uh, Geneva, and in um, Zurich, uh, multiple places. There was an entire Reformation in England. So that at the, by the time we get to the middle of the 1500s, there were wars going on between the Roman Catholic Church, who's trying to keep their, their position in power in all of these young European nations and these nations who are breaking away. And that concluded with the Peace of Augsburg that said, basically that the religion that the government chooses, that the state or the magistrates chooses for an area will be the religion of that area. And so you end up with Protestant states and Roman Catholic states at the end of that period. So that's kind of the overview of the Protestant Reformation. Now, what what points do you all remember or what stood out to you about the Protestant Reformation? Anything? Like, oh, go ahead, Shirley. Like that, Ananias, Sapphira thing. Are they they stole and or lied about having some money or some land? In Acts, yes. How did that? Uh, how what did that? How did that relate to you? What, what were you thinking about that? Just the idea of the corruption and how that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we do have sort of that, even though, you know, that occurred, you know, so many centuries before, and yet you see that very kind of behavior sort of growing in the church as the church's power and wealth grows. And it's, it's probably the case that when an organization becomes very powerful and very wealthy, that then the corruption um, is, is seems pervasive, and that was the the state of the Roman Catholic Church at the time. Very corrupt. Yeah, not everyone. You know, there were many, many sincere Christians within the Roman Catholic Church, and yet there was a lot of corruption as well. Yeah. Anything else come to mind? We have the 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 main points of protest. Um, that the reformers um, brought out. And um, those are, are elements that we still uh, uh, have as tenants of our faith now, today, we as Protestants. So, you know, everyone who's a Western Christian but not a Roman Catholic is a Protestant, part of that protest um, break away from the Catholic Church. So we have that uh, scripture was alone the primary authority, not scripture and tradition or scripture and church hierarchy, scripture and the Pope, but rather just scripture. And so we live that as Protestants today, don't we? We feel like, you know, the, the Bible is the authority for what it means to be a Christian. Um, then we have the idea of salvation by grace alone through faith alone. The 
pro the Roman Catholic Church had um, had quite a lot of uh, expansion of doctrine we've talked about in some of our earlier lessons. And one of the things that they tried to do was bolster assurance of salvation, a person's belief that they were saved. And they said, well, we can bolster that by providing a way to atone for the earthly um, effects of sin with penance, with indulgences. But those backfired so that it, by the time of the Reformation, many sincere Catholics, sincere Christians um, in the only church there was, the Catholic Church, felt that they could never do enough. They just felt a constant load of guilt and fear of purgatory and hell. And the there was always ne a need to do more, more prayers of the saints, more seeking out relics, more penance, more indulgences. And that was part of the impetus for um, the Reformation, and it also ties into our lesson tonight. So we'll, we'll be on the lookout for that. And then there was a difference in the sacraments. You know, I mentioned the kind of proliferation, expansion of complexity of doctrine and the Roman Catholic Church had seven sacraments and the Protestants brought it back down to only two, the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper and the, uh, and baptism. And so those are the sacraments that we, in fact, practice. Um, and they are, um, you know, in a, in a back to the Bible sense, those are the ones that are instituted and practiced by Jesus Christ. Okay. Questions or comments of that on that? Well, um, we're moving into the next period. So we had that period of uh, Reformation where um, they want to reform, you know, it's named that because they wanted to reform within the Catholic Church, but they end up breaking away and becoming a group of the Reformed, people who were Reformed away from the Catholic Church. And some of the churches were named that. So we're going to talk about the Dutch Reformed Church. That is the Protestant group um, in Holland. And so that, you know, there's that idea, like they're now the Dutch Reformed Church. They've become Reformed away from the Roman Catholic Church. So you've got a period where there are these new groups. They aren't Roman Catholic. They know what they don't believe, but there's several, and they have various leaders who have differing ideas and things are very unsettled. So thinking logically, what happens next? What's the next step in their progression? Uh, I guess deciding what they do believe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, they have to figure it out and they may have started, you know, those those points that I highlighted are a very small percentage of what it means to be a Christian, aren't they? Um, which is the good news in that all of these faiths, you know, all of these versions of the Christian faith have the same core of belief. And yet, you know, they they still have to hammer a lot out, right? They meet with other groups, they debate. Some of that was happening already within the Reformation period, but it increases in the next phase. They start hammering out what they believe and writing it down and getting it detailed. And so we call this next period confessionalization or they're building confessions. So confessions are kind of a written down answer to the question of what do you believe? And, uh, you know, they, they're all of these groups are proliferating these very detailed confessions. They become very specific. And everyone in an area was supposed to subscribe to them. And if you're in a place and this is the confession of faith that that, that nation comes up with, your choices are to convert or move or die because you, you're, there's no separation of church and state like we would be expecting. You don't get choices. I mean, you can leave and go somewhere Roman Catholic or somewhere where, that's Lutheran instead, or, you know, you have, those are the, those are the only options, either that or you're a heretic. And being a heretic is not a good thing to be. 
Um, now, this is a little um, unfamiliar to us because we come out of the Church of Christ Fellowship, which has traditionally not had a codified confession, which is a kind of pendulum swing um, on the other end from this impulse. But we can see after the Reformation that it would be very logical. Let's figure out exactly what we do believe and get it all nailed down. Now, that process leads to um, figuring out some things, but it also leads to conflict. And so not only is this the period of confessionalization, but it's also the period of conflict. And we're going from the mid 1500s, um, 1555, the Peace of Augsburg, into the mid 1600s, the end of the 30 Years War. And the 30 Years War is an example of the kind of conflict that was larger scale than just, you know, bickering over these confessions of faith. Yes, there was that, but there was also, remember how we talked about the feudal system ended and we had a rise of nations in Europe and those nations, new nations that comes with nationalism. And there was a lot of fighting over power, politics, nationalism. And so we have some a, a period of time where we have the so-called wars of religion. And yet they're not really about religion. There were religious differences involved in some cases, more in some cases than others, but they're also just regular wars, uh, wars about power, wars about wealth and titles and politics, and, and they don't always divide among uh, along religious lines. The Thirty Years' War, um, which Dr. Stanglin will mention, was kind of a World War Zero in a way. It was a series of wars among multiple European nations, and it was devastating to Europe in death toll, in atrocities, in destruction of infrastructure, fields, um, harvests, you know, like this was, it, it was a, a, a terrible um, time in, in that way. And this gave rise to something we're going to get to next week, which will be kind of this inkling of the idea like, well, if this was about religion, which we've already said, it wasn't really, but if it was named to be about religion, then the question gets asked, is religion really good for us? Maybe Christianity is bad. Maybe it leads to all this kind of wars and problems. Maybe it's hurting us. So keep that in mind because, you know, we're, we're, we're on a pendulum and next week we get into where that part has an effect. So we're in the period of confessionalization and conflict. Now within, uh, any questions on that? That's kind of the, the, the next era, the, the next hundred years, mid 1500s to mid 1600s. Okay, so um, we'll get into some specifics today. Within each faith tradition, there are, I said, ongoing conflicts about those confessions, what what counts, who who can, whose beliefs count as being um, right according to the confession. The, all those questions, um, and one of them is a specific doctrinal issue that is basically been the primary issue in the Western church um, back to the time of St. Augustine or Augustine. He says this was the preeminent early Western scholar. He died in 430, but he had all these ideas about the fall, original sin, and God's sovereignty. And out of his work comes the, the, this this huge question and it is what is the nature of God's sovereignty what does it mean that God is in charge and God makes the decisions what does it mean regarding who is elect or predestined to be saved what does it mean regarding human free will. This issue dominates Western theology going forward, and we still see it very present today. And the uh, one big question is, when God chooses who will be saved, predestined, elect, is there any human role? 
and the Augustinian predestination, or Dr. Stanglin also called it strict predestination in last week's video, says God's sovereignty is complete. God alone elects who will be saved for God's own purposes, and there is nothing in any human belief or action or acceptance that has anything at all to do with it. And this becomes, just as it's been an issue along and along, it's an issue to the reformers. It comes up as they're doing their confessions, right? And this is an important question because it shapes our understanding of who, who God is. What is God like? What is, what is the meaning of God's being and God's providence and God's uh, sovereignty and guidance? You know, what does that mean? And what is humanity for? Um, but it's also an assurance of salvation topic. So remember, we talked about how the Roman Catholic Church, it's like you always need more penance, more indulgences, more seeking out relics, more begging the prayers of the saints. And so the reformers came in and said, good news. You don't need all that stuff. You don't need to keep trying and, and, and striving and working. You don't have to work for, for it because God alone does it. God is so, you know, God's power is complete. God chooses who will be saved and makes them saved. And so you don't have to worry. Now, as a assurance of salvation, you know, approach, what's the problem with that? Oh, Becky, unmute yourself. That you don't, you're saying that you don't have to. What's the question again? Because I got a little confused. So the reformers subscribe to this strict, uh, over, in general, yeah. in general, they subscribe to this strict predestination where God alone chooses who's going to be saved and human belief or response or acceptance is completely irrelevant. Only God, God only does it. Well, I still think you have to, um, show that you believe. In the reformed understanding, um, which uh, Dr. Stanglin will explain that uh, later Calvin would come along and write a lot about this. And so we sometimes think of this as Calvinism. It, you know, it started as the reformers, part of the reformers response to Roman Catholicism, but it's all the same, but doctrinally the same as Calvinism, right? Mm -hmm. So we're more familiar sometimes with Calvinism. But the problem is like, so they would say that, yes, you'll show that you believe because God made you. God made you believe. So, of course, you'll show you believe. Well, uh, what were you going to say, Paige? Well, I was going to say that the major problem would be how do you know? if you, How do you know if you're saved or not? If God is the one making the choice and he's already done it way in the past, how do you know? <laughs> How do you know, right? So it's again, assurance of salvation remains a tricky subject, right? And the the solutions still have the same questions, you know, embedded into them. And so exactly. Well, so keep, so hold that thought. One example, uh, you know, I said this issue came up. It comes up in it within the Roman Catholic Church um, in the this whole like, what does predestination mean? Is God choosing? Are we choosing? Do we accept faith ourselves or does God do it for us? Or it comes up in all of the different denominations, you know, eventually. But one example is in the Dutch Reformed Church and um, a prominent uh, professor, uh, previously a pastor, was Arminius. He became a pastor and was in pastoral ministry for 15 years. He, um, uh, during that time and in his subsequent professorship, he was all in an atmosphere of strict predestination. 
But as he ministered to his flock, he kept seeing the same problems over and over. And one of those problems is, well, the elect are, you know, the, the, those who are chosen to be saved, the elect are supposed to know that they're saved. They're supposed to feel their assurance. And I'm worried I'm not saved, so I must not be. And if I'm not elect and there's nothing I can do about it, what does anything matter? And so that leads to despair. And the other problem that he frequently saw was the opposite. Well, the elect are chosen by God and can never lose their salvation. So what does it matter how much I sin? I'm already elect. I might as well do whatever I want. And he called that uh, careless or negligent security. So it's sort of, it's the same problem, you know, that, that you described, but it worked out in, in two different ways, despair or this careless security. And so Arminius is struggling with that among his um, flock. And in the course of preaching through Romans um, and going back to the Bible, it, this is, this is one of those back to the Bible situations. It led him away from the Augustinian view and he began preaching it differently he began preaching an idea that was the early um the church fathers uh, kind of viewpoint was um that god elects to save those who are willing to believe those who are willing to come to god are those god draws to um god's self and so um and this produced a huge controversy and it blew up and it had repercussions for in. And that is what Dr. Stanglin is going to talk about. But I want to point out before we do that, you know, this was very much a, uh, a lived out problem. You know, people are living, you know, he's watching people struggle and that is what is prompting this. It's not really, um, you know, a dry and abstract, you know, it was a lived out problem. And that this same debate, we're going to focus on Arminius because he sort of became the name going forward for the other view of predestination. You know, just like Calvin, we would call something maybe Calvinist because Calvin became the name that we associated with it. He became, the Arminius became the name that we would associate with uh, conditional predestination, that God elects someone based on the condition of their willingness, their willingness to believe, their willingness to accept God's grace. So Dr. Sanglin will flesh that, all of that out, and then we'll talk about like the those two different views. But um, this uh, debate went on everywhere. The uh, within the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuits fall one way and the Dominicans fall the other. In the Lutheran Church, there's the Genesio Lutherans and the Philippus, and they are op on opposite sides of this predestination thing. In the Anglican Church, there was this, a big debate about those who were not strict predestinationists. Can they still subscribe to the Confession of Faith, the 39 Articles that are the Anglican um, confession. So it, it happens elsewhere in a, and, it, and going forward, we see it in multiple groups that haven't yet formed in this period of history, but they, you know, as they form, it happens over and over again. So any questions or comments before we go on to the video? Okay, great. Um, if you are watching this after the fact, now is the time to go to the Center for Christian Studies website, log in with our class account, and watch video module 10, The Arminian Controversy. Okay, we are back from watching the video um, on the Arminian Controversy example of this particular doctrinal issue that shows up in multiple um, fellowships. Um, any initial thoughts or questions about the video? That's confusing, but I think I got it. I was taking notes. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, so it is. I, I also have a, a timeline that shows the partial lineage of the major Christian churches of the 20th century, and I'm going to try to 
send it to you, Deanna, so you could share it. I don't know. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So okay. some of what um, I thought was, you know, he mentioned um, several groups and um, leaders within those groups that, you know, we may not know. He's like, well, of course, within Methodism. Well, that, only if you know what Methodists are about, right? Only if you're familiar with Methodism and the Methodist Church. So it just, it, depending on, um, you know, like Whitfield, who's that? You know, so that it, it may or may not, that part of it may or may not have spoken to you, but this idea and um, some of us may be more familiar with someone who's Calvinist, right, um, than any of the terminology that he's using is reformed. It's just that historically this happened in reformed was a group before Calvin was ever um, converted from Catholicism and writing, you know, so he, he, Calvin actually came later, but same doctrinally, same thing. So what I thought we would do with our last few minutes of discussion was sort of sum up the reformed or Calvinist view and sum up the Arminian view, and then sort of think about well, what are the problems or questions that each one brings up. So um, would some would anyone feel comfortable uh, summing up the reformed or the Calvinist view? Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, give it a try. Um, so they were all about uh, the elect, uh, which were God's chosen. And they were more like God, God is the only one that has any say over who is saved and who is not. He has already made this decision nothing you can do or say has any has any bearing on that fact yeah yeah exactly exactly and it really it um it stems from an idea of god's sovereignty that has god being the one who's making all the choices right and and the idea that um that things of god are so infinitely good and powerful compared to things of a human it's not like if god offers you saving faith you don't as a you know mere human have the ability to turn it down right like it it's a it's a gift that's at, at the level of of um making the choice for you um, and so it's an idea that all the choices are God, God's. Um, he, Dr. Stanglin used the word perseverance, which is a doctrinal word for uh, once saved, always saved. Like if you, perseverance of the saints means that anyone who is saved can never lose their salvation. They persevere in salvation to the end. So what are the problems with that? What, what question, like, you're like, but what about? So what are the what abouts? You get away with anything. Okay, the the these very the ideas that we talked about despair or careless security. It it sort of leads you like, how does it lead you to live if if all of that's already done? Yep, yep. What else? Uh, what about free will? <laughs> yeah, I mean this is huge, right? What about free will? So if God chooses and you have no choice, what is that? How does that mesh with the scriptures that say to choose God, to, to, to be willing to have faith? Um, you know, why would we be uh, exhorted towards faith if God is doing all that for us and we're not, we have no choices in the matter, right? And so the Reformed or Calvinist response is, well, humans do have free will, but we're so um, broken um by being sinful that we can all all we can do with our free will is choose sin and so god must you know all of the goodness comes from god and it's powerful in that it says um it, it elevates um god's goodness and it it really hones in on the truth that we don't choose well and we know this about ourselves yeah yeah but in the end you still have that problem well what about human free will yeah what else 
What about the people who are not elect? So within the Calvinist or Reformed view, those people never had a chance. Well, they did, and what they did with it was sin, and the fact that all they could do was sin because that's what humans do is just the consequence of fallen humanity. And so the, I, but, that, but then we're left with the question, well, if God chooses to damn some humans and they because he didn't he didn't put his gift of grace on them is that a good god what do we what does that tell us about who god is um and the reformed answer is well sure he could let everyone sin it shows his great goodness that he doesn't let everyone um perish i said sin i meant perish um so that idea of is if is it good if god if some never really had a chance to make the choice for God. And then if God is making all those choices, who is really responsible for sin? If human beings never had the option to do anything but sin, and God is the one making all the choices, does that mean God is ultimately responsible for sin? And that's a problem, right, within our theology. So there's that. Um, any other thoughts? We can go a level deeper and say, well, what would it mean then for scripture to speak of humans as co-workers in Jesus Christ? Because if we never had a chance to choose, then is really, is it, is it just puppetry? Is God just pulling all of the strings? And, um, you know, the, the version of Reformed theology in this period would say no. Um, there's been a resurgence of the new Calvinism or the new Reformed um, in this um, very, uh, you know, a complex of ideas, right? Uh, in recent years, um, and there are a lot of prominent speakers and teachers who are of this school. Um, Tim Keller, John Piper, there's a whole group of them. They're very prolific in writing and public sermons. And, you know, there's a lot of their material about. And the new Calvinists are much more willing to go like to the logical conclusion, which says God makes all the choices everything's already decided providence is running it all and all the choices are god's and that's we're just glad that we get to be on god's side and so it's very deterministic and you say like well but what are we even doing here then and so there is a problem let's sum up the arminian view because we're almost out of time here Anyone want to take a stab at the alternative? Uh, not good enough. <laughs> not ever good enough. Um, yeah, that idea of not ever good enough keeps showing up in, it showed up in the Roman Catholic, it showed up in the Reformers. You know, you get that throughout. And I don't know that we ever escape that. But the Arminian view of election or predestination is what? It's conditional on whether you accept it or not. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So God offers his salvation. He offers his grace. And to those who are willing, he, they accept it. And that's how you become one of God's elect, one of the predestined, is by mm -hmm. your willingness to accept. Now, the grace of God still does all the work. We still don't have the ability to work ourselves to salvation, but God's grace does the work of salvation. But if we accept it, that's how we be. That's why we are the elect is that we're willing to accept it. And that is the Arminian view. Now, if that feels more familiar to you, that is because the, our, our church tradition within the Church of Christ has traditionally been Arminian or anti-Calvinist. So that 
you know, you may have grown up with those ideas as the natural view and that that would be expected. Um, Dr. Stanglin mentioned how the restoration movements went Arminian and restoration in America, the restoration movement of the Churches of Christ, Disciples of Christ, Christian Church um, were have been Arminian. But there are always little pieces of both um, both threads within our fellowships. Um, so you'll, you'll run into some of each. Um, the problems on the Arminian side, uh, some would say, well, if humans can resist God, I mean, is that even God? Is that even sovereignty? If humans can resist it, if it's weak? Um, and the Arminian position would be that God chooses, not because he's weak, but because he chooses to restrain his power to allow space for real choice among the, for, for each human being to make a real choice. And so it, you know, the sovereignty of God is still present. God has just as much power, but God restrains some of that in order to allow grace to be resistible. There's also the question of whether the Arminian view is more works based. You know, if a human being can accept God's faith, is that a work? If by believing you can say yes or no to God, then are you saying that you did it, that you worked for your salvation, that you did better than the next guy, and that, that's why you're saved? And so that question is, you know, it tends to be at the heart of debates between the two sides. And the Arminian position is that, you know, there there is a place for human um not effort towards salvation, but at least allowing oneself not to resist. And so you know, when Stephen says you always resist the Holy Spirit, there is a human choice to resist God's saving grace or not to resist it. And so there's real choice in there. Um, and it's not earning your salvation. It's merely choosing not to turn away from it. Any questions on either side? You the... I always thought when I was a younger, it's like, okay, what happens to these people who never hear about Jesus, or who never um, get preached to, or, or, you know, just don't know? And I don't know. I just have to say, that'd be great. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. And, in, and in each, um, scheme you have a, that question yeah and it does it it ex you could speak to it from either viewpoint but the question is a hard one on either side yeah. what else well um you can see that this is history but it's deeply connected with doctrinal differences, right? Um, this is an element of doctrine that I find particularly compelling. Um, I believe with Arminius and the early church that God empowers us by grace, not only to accept salvation if we are willing, but more than that, to be co-workers with Christ. And in some ways, this is the best news of the gospel, that God not only wants us, but that God wants every one of us who is willing and not only to be saved, but also to do, make real choices and do real work in God's kingdom that God prepared in advance to us to do. And that we have a real contribution to make because of the love of Jesus Christ. And it is available to every single person. And when you believe along the Arminian lines, you can say every single one of you, God's grace is available to you right now, if only you will turn to Jesus Christ. And that is a very, very beautiful thing. It's very good news, heart of the gospel. So, um, you know, the history of it and the those questions and the debate it, it goes on. It's real today for us as well. 
I want to end by just pointing out that even though I th these are um, significant uh, doctrinal differences, both sides of, of this argument um, believe in the core of the Christian faith that we have had all along. One God and Father, creator of heaven and earth, God's only son, fully human and fully God, Jesus Christ, who sacrifices himself in self-giving love so that God will dwell with man now through the Holy Spirit and in the end, in the new heaven and new earth. And that idea is all the way across all of them. So as we watch first the Protestants break off from the Roman Catholics and then the Protestants splinter from among themselves and the denominationalism proliferate, keep remembering that that core remains common to all of us. Next week, we will continue to look at the history of the church in the period of um, you know, beginning mid 1600s, enlightenment and skepticism. And we'll see that some of the elements that we discussed last week and this week, the technological shifts and discoveries, the more cynical philosophy, the repercussions of wars that said maybe Christianity is bad for people. All of those begin to bear fruit in the this next skeptical period. And so we will talk about that next week. Thank you so much.